All right, everyone, this is John Connor from Crossing Bridge Advisors. Thank you for taking the time to answer the poll questions as uh, we waited for more people to join. Uh, so at this time, again, uh, we are very thankful and appreciative to Flya for hosting today's webinar. Uh, we, the webinar's title is Pre-Merger SPACs, an alternative to short-term fixed income allocations. And again, uh, presented by David Sherman today. Uh, so before we get into the presentation, uh, if we can go to the next slide real quick, just want to read a brief safe harbor. And uh, this presentation may include forward-looking statements. As a general matter, forward-looking statements reflect our current expectations and projections in relation to the strategies managed by Crossing Bridge Advisors and or Cohansic Management. Uh, any direct or indirect references to specific security, security sectors, or investment vehicles made in this report should not be taken as a recommendation or solicitation to buy or sell a particular security or invest in any specific investment strategy. There is no guarantee that any of the information or investment Ooh. strategies discussed will be suitable or profitable. Current statistics may not be indicative of future positioning. Next slide, please. So before we get into the presentation, today is really just all about education. Um, we've been in the SPAC space. David Sherman has been in the SPAC space going back over 15 years now. And SPACs are an area that we're very familiar with and have been investing in uh, for, again, over the past 15 years. Um, we are going to walk through the life cycle SPACs, how they work. And then also we recently launched a pre-merger SPAC ETF, which uh, we will walk through at the end of this presentation. But one thing that we always encourage and we find the presentations to work out best when we do this, there's a Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. We encourage activity and participation because we find that if you guys were answering your guys' questions that um, you know, we want this to be as helpful and beneficial as possible to all parties on the call. So with that said, I'm gonna be turning this over to David Sherman and uh, we hope you enjoy the presentation. So good morning, everybody. I appreciate you joining us. And um, do you want me to start the video? You get to see me too, evidently. All right, so uh, for those who presentation on the screen, I'm also on video, hi. Uh, anyone who uh, has any questions, you can put them in the chat line. I've got it up on the second screen so we can get the attention seeing it. Um, so you can, it's a way of interrupting the conversation if I'm going too slow or going too fast or just want clarification. Uh, so with that, we're just gonna go into it. John Connor already went through uh, who Crossing Bridge is. I just wanna reiterate that Crossing Bridge uh, is a subsidiary and affiliate of Cohansic Management LLC. We were started back in 1996. We have $2.8 billion in assets. Uh, we have a, a firm of 13 strong employees and also, uh, some of the data is coming for this presentation from spacinformer.com. And that information is that, that that website is an affiliate of ours. It's in beta site. Next slide, please. Okay, so these are just the products uh, that Cohansic and Crossing Bridge as a group uh, manage, primarily 40 Act funds. The point of this that I really want to focus on is SPACs, the way that we're managing them primarily, although we do do uh, some pipes and we do some other aspects of SPACs, but the conversation today will be primarily focused on SPACs as a fixed income-like security. And it's something we can speak highly to because an area of our expertise is both high yield and ultra short and low duration fixed income products. And uh, we've been doing this for a while. And in the pipe side, I can talk a little bit about that because we're, we have a lot of structuring experience. Um, so that's sort of where we are. And I just wanna give you that sense. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's start with the basics, how SPACs work. Uh, I apologize for those who have some significant knowledge here. And for those who are starters, it may be a little too advanced. I'm trying to play to a wide audience, so we'll see how this goes. Next slide. Okay, so SPACs are a blank check company. This means a sponsor decides he wants to raise cash and it's gonna be held in a trust for him to seek an acquisition target. So the sponsor says the best way to raise this cash is by taking a company public. So they create an IPO. 
that is what you call the SPAC, the entity that is trading when it initially comes out. So the SPAC itself is a public company. It has cash, it has no businesses. And the management team of the SPAC is the people I refer to as the sponsor. And they're out looking for an acquisition target to merge into the public company, the SPAC. And then the successor company will be the underlying overall equity. So the cash that's raised in the IPO goes in a trust account for the benefit of public shareholders, you and me. And in order to raise the money, the SPAC sponsor usually issues a unit, usually consisting of the IPO stock, as well as some bells and whistles, such as a warrant, right? This is, hey, you're going to give me cash. You want to earn some return on your cash. I want to incentivize you to buy my IPO so that you can sort of have a goal to make money while you're waiting for us to, to acquire a company. So let's take a simple example. They decide to raise $200 million in a blank check company. So the SPAC goes public. It raises $200 million from the market, from Wall Street. It trades as a unit. And this SPAC, for instance, has one common share. And this SPAC in this example has one warrant, which has five years to expiration and allows the participants who have the warrant to own the SPAC or the company they merge with at all of the upside above 1150 with sometimes a call feature at $18. So it's, it's strike price is 1150. The cash that's raised in the public company goes into a trust for the benefit of the shareholders, not the warrant holders, not the management or sponsors, for the benefit of the shareholders. So you effectively have a, an indirect collateral to the cash and trust. And that cash invests in treasuries and in T-bills and holds cash. Now, sometime in the next 60 days, they'll take the unit that was public and they'll split it into common stock, which is what the trust is benefited of, and the warrants. So then there'll be three pieces of securities trading, the original units, the common stock, and the warrants in this example. And you can hold on to your units, you can sell your warrants, and you can split your units and then sell your warrants and keep the stock, or you can sell your stock and keep the warrants, or you can split it and just keep them together, just not have it as a unit. So you have four options as a unit holder. Once that happens, there are people that will buy warrants outright, people that will buy stock outright. Again, the cash in the trust is for the benefit of the shareholder, not the warrant holder. So if you're a unit holder, only your share portion is where you benefit. Now, the SPAC finds a target. They're super excited. They haven't announced it to the public yet. They, 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 go to the, they go to the capital markets and they say, help us find people to give us additional capital. So when we announce it, there'll be what they call a pipe, which stands for public investment in private equity. And the pipe will be a, a convertible bond, a straight bond, equity, a preferred, various different types of securities. And the point of the pipe is to do two things. One, to provide more cash for the transaction. And two, to provide for redemptions of the original SPAC holders. So here's a little twist. When you give, when you buy the public shares, I stand corrected, when you buy the public shares, what are you, what are you signing up for? You have cash that collateralizes your investment, but the SPACs themselves have a life. Typically it's two years or less. So there's a stated liquidation date. It could be 15 months, it could be two years. So in fact, today we participated as a firm in an IPO that has a liquidation date of 15 months. That means they have to liquidate in 50 months if they don't get a deal done. And the other thing that a SPAC shareholder gets is if they announce a deal and it's approved by shareholders, which you get a vote in, but you don't want to participate in the successor company. You don't want to own the deal they did. You just don't like it. You have the right to redeem your shares for the, your pro rata interest in the trust account. So if you bought shares at 10, and then the deal we just did today that's trading, it was over collateralized. Now go back to the next slide for a second. We'll get there. Uh, it was over collateralized at 1020. 
So there's 20 cents more collateral for the shareholders than the amount you paid. And that 20 cents was provided by the management team and the sponsor, not by the IPO proceeds. So in that case, if I don't like the deal in that I wanna participate, I can vote to approve the deal to end the life of the SPAC if the deal gets approved, and then also get my $10.20 that I paid $10 for. Plus, if I kept the warrants, my warrants have that option on the future business. Okay, so they go and find a target company. And then if shareholders approve the target company, it's public. So once it becomes a successor company, it's an equity analysis. But prior to it becoming a successor company, it's a fixed income analysis. And it's a fixed income analysis because you have a liquidation date, which is a maturity, and you have a change of control provision, which allows you to put your shares back at par value or get a premium to par value. Okay, so now we can go to the next slide. So before I go into this, anyone who has questions just on that basic piece, please type them in the chat room and I'll explain it. In the meantime, here's the life cycle of a SPAC. Going back to what I said, the sponsors or management team decide they wanna form a, a, a SPAC. They, they either put up the capital money to do it or they raise capital money. To give you an idea on a $200 million IPO SPAC, the sponsor needs to come up with at least $8 million. So he's gonna go raise $8 million. And what the sponsor gets in return for the risk capital, because he loses all his money if the SPAC liquidates, what he gets in return for his risk capital is he gets 20% of the successor company or 20% of the upside, depending on which structure he chooses. So for instance, there's a Morgan Stanley structure that changes the dynamics. Okay, then he does the IPO. So the management team does the IPO, right? You gave them $200 million. You have a unit in my example, which is a stock and a warrant, and it's over collateralized by 1020. So he put in more than $8 million. And the, the management team is looking for targets. So they do target research. Okay, after they announce the target research um, and they reach a negotiation, they have a shareholder meeting. The SPAC shareholders, the common shareholders of the SPAC, either can vote in favor of the deal or against the deal. If they vote in favor, the SPAC merges with the target and you have a company that goes forward, it's a public company. And if they vote against it, the sponsor can go back and do the whole target search all over again. Typically a SPAC's 24 months. Again, the deal we just did today is 15 months. That, that's when they absolutely have to liquidate if they don't merge. Okay, so there's a question here. At some point, can you address the current dynamics in the market in respect to pipes, fundraising, and how many shareholders are closing and redeeming? Yes, I can, and I will. Um, we'll get there. Thank you for that, Doug. All right, next slide. Okay, so as I said, if when SPACs are seeking a target, they have a liquidation date and they have a zero coupon and you have the right to put it back to the, the company if you don't like the deal. And uh, you may or may not have kept the bells and whistles like the warrants. So if you invest in SPAC seeking targets and you buy them at a discount to the value in the trust. So in my previous example, $200 million was raised uh, in the IPO. It's a 1020 deal. So 2% on $200 million is an additional $4 million. So there's $204 million in trust for the benefit of shareholders. And the sponsor put up 8 million to launch the $200 million SPAC plus the 4 million of over collateralization, which is 12 million. So the sponsor has risk capital. So if you buy that, $204 million collateral trust of the 200 million shares that are say, let's trading at 985 because they sold off the warrants, right? They have a, a, they have a, a gross yield um, that is high. Um, and as a result of that gross yield, that's gonna amortize over the life of the fund that has a decent yield to liquidation in the current market today. And the, 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 and if they announce a transaction sooner than the liquidation date, 
your yield to liquidation will go higher. Because if you had 15 months to close a deal and you close it in six and you price it at a 15 month yield to liquidation, now your liquidation date six months. And once they announce the deal, that would be SPACs with pending deals, your profile is different. It moves more into an arbitrage, right? You have a gross yield that is attractive, but on a yield to liquidation, it's not so good because you're, you're expecting the deal to close in 60 to 120 days, okay? So if it doesn't close, your, your maturity got extended. However, on an annualized IRR, if the deal closes, you're likely to earn a higher return than those that are having, looking for deals that are trading on a liquidation date. And more importantly, as the deals announced, the market becomes more educated, it may trade at a premium to trust value because people are excited in the deal. And a recent deal where that's an example is Gore's Guggenheim that recently did in the last uh, couple of weeks. Okay. Um, so we have another question and I'll just announce it and then I'll get to it or not get to it, but I wanna see it. If I'm not an investor in the SPAC IPO, but rather buying the secondary market, will I also get the warrants with the shares I purchase? So that's a good question. So now that it's in the secondary market, for the first approximately 60 days, the SPAC only trades as a unit. There is a period where the unit splits at the option of the unit holder into stock or warrants. So you can buy the units in the secondary market, which may or may not trade at a discount to the trust value because there's a warrant attached to it. But again, typically it does. And when they split, you could buy just the warrant, just the stock, which has the put feature, or the unit, and you buy it. So typically the unit has the symbol of the stock with a U at the end, the warrant has a W at the end, and the symbol of the stock is the split stock. So yes, you can buy just the stock. And in fact, most of the time, we buy stocks in the secondary market of companies that are seeking targets, and to some degree, those that have pending deals. And it's a discount to the trust value. So let's say in my previous example, there's 1020 in trust, the IPO and it's 10, and it's a unit, and now it splits. Well, first, let's say after the IPO, the $10 purchase price went to 1020. It went to trust value. This is not a this is not the current market conditions. It would typically trade at a discount to trust value, but let's say it did. When you split the thing, the price of the warrant and the price of the stock combined should equal the unit price. So in other words, if you got one stock and one warrant and you could sell the stock, the warrant for 70 cents, then the stock should trade under that example as 1020 minus 70 cents, which give you 950, which means you're buying at 950 to get 1020 in the future on the stock and you paid 70 for the warrant. If you get half a warrant, you'd get 35 cents in value, 70 cents divided by two. If you got a third of a warrant, same kind of math. So yes, you can buy it. So a lot of people who either can't participate in the IPO but want to treat SPACs as a fixed income-like security will buy it in the secondary market because you know, when the warrant splits, somebody's going to value that warrant. It's going to decrease the price of the stock. And then they can buy it at a cheaper discount um, to have the the collateral value is part of theirs. So I hope I answered the question. Next page, please. Okay, so that's how SPACs work. I, I, I'm not forgetting the pipe question. I wanna get through a little bit about the universe for those who are unfamiliar. I will get to the pipe question, Doc. Okay, so now anyone else has questions again, please keep doing it. So this is the market today. This is literally as of Friday, October 8th, to give an idea of the universe. The data has been compiled by SPACinformer.com, S-P-A-C-Informer.com. You can all go there, you can get all the data. And unlike most SPAC websites, we provide the data for free. If you sign up for the letter every week, it's in beta stage, every week we will send you the entire SPAC universe for free in a, in a way you can manipulate it in Excel and you don't have to pay for it. And we did this because we feel that the world should be able to decide how they wanna invest in SPACs by either using an ETF, a fund manager, or do it themselves. I describe it, which makes John Connor, our product specialist, annoyed. You know, if you do it yourself, it's like being a fisherman. And some people like to fish, 
But others, they've got a big schedule. They don't like the fish. They want to know they're going to be successful. So they hire, they buy the fish, the fish store. So if you buy our SPAC ETF or one of, or somebody else's product, you're paying retail at the fish store. But SPAC informers to allow you to be a fisherman. So let's go to the next slide. Oh, by the way, if you go to SPAC Inform, you sign up, it's in beta site. We have a lot of ideas that we're initiating. Um, but if you have specific ideas, we love feedback because we want to make it a resource for everybody. So today, there are a total of 589 SPACs. That's literally today. That ignores all the SPACs that were issued in the last couple of years that have now found merger partners that are public companies. Of those, and all the ones that are coming out uh, regularly. Oh, I'll mention the website again, sure. In fact, I'll even type it in the, in the, in the group here. It's spacinformer.com. There you go, hopefully it'll go. There, I just typed it in. Okay, so the entire SPAC market, and, and, and I see that Grant asked me about the SPAC universe cooling down and, and you know, does this help the SPAC market or hurt the SPAC market? And what does it mean to it as the future SPAC, which I will talk about also in a few minutes. So today there's 589 SPACs, 469 are currently looking for deals. So those who wanna say, can I buy SPACs at a discount? and just decide after they announce the deal whether I wanna merge into it or not. And if the world likes it, I'll get a pop. And if it doesn't, I'll redeem my shares at par, if you think of it as a bond. And meanwhile, I know what the liquidation date is. I can calculate a yield to maturity or yield to liquidation. You can go look at all the 469, where are they trading? What's in trust? What's the discount to trust? SPAC Informer will give you that. That's 469. The other 120, it's more now, because there've been deals like one announced today of a SPAC we own. Um, and they typically go up after they announce a deal. They don't always go above trust value, but they go up because there's now a shorter potential uh, liquidation date than prior. So the 120 SPACs at the end of Friday had announced deals waiting to close. Um, there you have to look at it more like an arbitrage. What's the gross spread between what I'm paying versus um, the, the um, trust? Or if it's trading above collateral value, do I think that there'll be enough momentum and enthusiasm and the deal's good enough that I want to get in early before the information gets more disseminated and understood? But there's 120 SPACs there. And the risk you take is that the deal blows up. Uh, uh, I, we didn't send the website to anybody. You have to go to the website. It says, can you, could you share the... I'll take care of it. Yes, John Connor will, will send you the slide presentation. Um, if you need it now, uh, I got put in the message, but in the meantime, this is John's email. There you go. Um, I hope I'm doing this better. I've had some practice as an NYU adjunct professor, so we're seeing how this is going. So in any event, there's 120 deals out there and it's more arbitrage. If the deal doesn't happen, you move back to the liquidation date. So you have to decide when you think it's going to close and what that, what that time period is. Also, by the way, if you're going to redeem from a deal, you have to make sure you hit the redemption date. If you miss the redemption date, which is typically, but not always, two days before the shareholder vote, you're going to be stuck in the deal. So it's really important you don't miss that. that there's 589 SPACs. Now let's talk about money. There's $135 billion out there looking for deals, $35 billion that have deals for a total of $170 billion. So it's a quite big market. The market's become very big this year and last year which is why we can do a dedicated strategy in SPAC ETFs today or SPACs generally, as opposed to just a sub part of our portfolio because the market's got big enough and I believe it will stay that way, which we can talk about in a little bit. Next slide. And why are we gonna next slide? Uh, I'll, I'll answer the question in a second. So the next slide, this is all the SPACs out there and it's just a scattergram between those seeking a deal on those pending, and you can sort of look at what the yield to liquidation is and the months to liquidation. So it's sort of interesting. You have two SPACs that are both have a deal announced and have seeking a target that it, on Friday were trading at a negative yield to liquidation, and they also had almost no life left in months to liquidation. Okay, next slide. And by the way, the goal of SPAC and form would be you could press on any one of those dots and see which SPAC it is, but we haven't programmed it yet. So again, this is the SPAC universe. 
This talks about when a yield to liquidation of SPACs, whether they're announced deals or not. So if it's an announced deal, it's going to have a low yield to liquidation, right? Because it's trading on a gross spread. But it shows you the universe and size of those in the yield. So there are today, as of Friday, there are, uh, there are $5.4 billion worth of SPACs trading between 25 and 3% yield to liquidation. And then another $1 billion of SPACs trading north of three and a half, three to three and a half, and another 2.4 billion trading north of three and a half. So if you just add that all up real quickly, right, you have over $8 billion, almost $9 billion of SPACs you can buy that are trading at two and a half percent yield to liquidation or more, right? Just if you want to look at it as a fixed income alternative to short duration securities, remember your collateral trust is T-bills. Now, there's a big part that are trading at one and a half and two and two and two and a half, but let's take the one and a half and two. You might say, well, why would I even want to buy those, right? Or why would I buy something a half a percent to 1%? Well, the sponsor might have more pedigree. You think it deals, it's currently got 20 months left to liquidation, but there was a rumor out. They might be negotiating to buy uh, a crypto mining company and it's a crypto mining company everybody sort of is familiar with. So people are buying it under the understanding that A, I think the liquidation dates, I think they're going to announce a deal. The liquidation date will now be moved to a successful merger, which will close in 60 to 120 days. And I get upside if people are super excited on the valuation. So therefore, I'm willing to earn less yield to liquidation for that opportunity. Or it could be somebody like Bill Foley or the Gores who just have pedigree. And people just say they successfully created deals that trade above par over the collateral value. So I want to participate like a pre-merger um, venture capital round. You get a slight discount to the deal for when they go public. Okay, so let me look at this question real quickly Why you all study this. Uh, David, for your purpose of buying SPACs, do you make money when the unit is over collateralized in the example you used and when buy SPACs at a discount aside from, okay. Uh, the not okay, so that's a good question. Uh, nominal interest. All right, so um, let me let me. There are SPAC investors that do many things, um, and I'm happy to address the different types. Uh, but to answer this specific question, uh, when I think of SPACs as fixed income like securities, one, I think of them as zero coupon bonds because the collateral trust earns interest. And you, the shareholder, get the benefit of that interest to build the collateral trust value up, right? But you don't get paid any coupons. So it's a zero coupon where in theory, if interest rates were high enough, your collateral value will grow at the end of the day. Your future value will go from $10 a share, let's say, to more because that interest will build up. I mean, they do have to pay tax on interest, by the way, not you, but the trust does. Because interest rates are so low, in fact, I think there is no value to that interest. And in fact, in some cases, the trust that's being held for the benefit of shareholders has certain carve out expenses, albeit small, that can be deducted from that collateral account. So one of those examples obviously is taxes on income earned. Another example would be Delaware business franchise taxes. So if it's a Delaware domiciled SPAC, you could actually end up with 999 instead of 10 because you may not earn out that franchise or you might end up with 999.997, right? Or 9.999, but you may, may not actually out earn the franchise tax. But yes, I look at the future value for simplicity purposes at $10. You know, in the old days, you would add over time more value to calculate your yield to liquidation, but you don't get that benefit, obviously, if they announce the deal sooner because you only get what it's earned. So one, that's how I look at the future value. On the present value, I try to buy it at a discount to, wow, we have a lot of questions. I didn't see these, okay. Um, which I'll go back to, I apologize. I didn't know, I was looking in the chat as opposed to the Q&A, so I apologize. So I'll get there, I, I'm sorry. Um, so I look and say, if I'm buying it at a discount to trust value, I'm buying it below par, I'm buying it at a discount to par. So I can calculate that yield. If they announce a deal, I can put it back to the, to the sponsor and shorten my maturity, which enhances my yield, right? If my yield to liquidation is 
2% in over two years, and they consummate a deal in a year, simplistically just multiply 2% by, you know, two, because it happened half the time, that's a 4% simple kind of analysis. And if it's a great deal, it'll trade through the trust value. And that's assuming I, you know, it doesn't take into account the warrants. And the warrants, I typically sell off because I don't know what deal they're worth. You get zero at the end and it lowers my cost as a fixed income security in the stock. However, I wouldn't sell warrant for five cents, right? Warrants today are worth about 28 cents, no matter how many units, if it's one for one, if it's, if it's a third of a warrant, the warrants sort of reflect the quality of the sponsor and the quality of what they're looking for. But let's say on average, it's 28 cents. Some are more, some are less. So that's going to add, if you sell it day one, 2.8% to your yield over time. So I hope that answered the question. Uh, all right, now let me, if it didn't, just retype it and I'll answer it. So Michael says to me, how long will this opportunity persist? What is your perspective of the Wall Street Journal calling SPAC a crowded trade? Okay, so first of all, I was actually in the journal, I think yesterday, the day before. I'm going to answer that. How do you find companies to buy? That one I'll answer. Is the sole reason to do it because it's easier than IPO? Okay, so that's a good question. So let me answer that one first. The SPAC sponsor does this because he wants to have the proceeds immediately there to show targets. You can go public immediately. It's quicker, it's cheaper than, than going public yourself, or you're a small company. Most of these companies are going to be mid cap or small cap. And that in theory, it's cheaper or it's quicker or it's better. I actually don't think that's necessarily the case. I think the advantage for a target to merge into a SPAC sponsor is the SPAC sponsor may actually add value, relationships, experience, um, how to be a public company. You know, a, an entrepreneurial private company is very different than being a public company. And the other reason private companies might want to uh, merge is because how are they compensating their employees, right? Stock options, a lot of them got private stock. So that's some of the reasons why uh, people merge into SPACs and the SPAC sponsors go public because quite frankly, they're getting paid a lot of money in, in, in performance uh, attribution if they're successful and you know they think they can find good deals. Um, yes, you are competing with PE firms, but also a lot of PE firms are actually embracing the SPAC model. Um, and in some ways, I think it's complementary because one of the problems in PE firms is they take a long time to get their companies public and distribute to their shareholders. Wow, we have a lot of questions. We're going to go over, by the way, because we have a lot of questions, just so you know. So some people can hang out or not. So um, I do want to answer one of these questions. I'm going to go more to the charts for people that only have an hour. And then I'm going to come back to some of these questions. And if, if you have to leave and I don't answer your question, you can certainly reach out to us. I'm just trying to manage time with all the information. One of the questions was, what about the Wall Street Journal and the SPAC market? So um, go to the next slide, please. Uh, so these are different yields you can get on SPAC Informer. Next slide. Next slide. This is all on SPAC Informer. So you can sort of look at this and we've covered it. Gives you an idea of the amount of yields out there. Next slide. And I'm going quickly because I just want to make sure of the material. Okay, so this gives you, again, it's on SPAC Informer different yield calculations, what the weighted average life is. The point of this is you can easily buy a large portfolio of SPACs. I mean, just take SPAC seeking targets. At, uh, you know, you can buy a large amount of SPACs. You know, you can buy 252 of them on a weighted average basis with a yield to liquidation of 1.89 and an expected maturity of 1.34 years. And obviously if they announce a deal in half that time, Simplistically, you can double that, and that's 252, right? So it gives you sort of a distribution, but that's that's the biggest candidate right now. Next slide. Okay, so this is about our ETF. So our ETF, I'm sort of covering this as we buy things below discount value. So we have an, an ETF uh, out there uh, that pursues a strategy of treating them as fixed income where you buy them at a discount, which is what I've talked about. Next slide. So it's trying to really be an alternative to income. Okay, so okay, so go back to the cross the previous slide. This is just our team. We don't need this. All right. So now, let me answer some of the other questions. So there's been a huge amount of SPACs issued from what I call Labor Day of last year to St. Patrick's Day of this year, 
And the SPAC market did something it very rarely does. It traded on enthusiasm, similar to the meme market. So the, um, as a result of that, uh, there was a huge amount of issuance. Um, and then a lot of people, A, realized they were overpaying for the potential opportunity. And that was driven because a bunch of SPACs invested in very VC-like deals that ultimately people got excited about, like DraftKings and SpaceX, et cetera. There are a lot of decent SPACs. There's a lot of decent SPACs that have traded above trust value as we sit here today that as merged companies are still doing well. An example would be Rocket Labs is trading 13, 14, 15. It closed in October. But there's a, a bigger proportion that are trading in the doghouse because either the sponsor overpaid or the business model doesn't make sense relative to the valuation or it doesn't work. So post-merger, there's going to be this huge universe of small mid-cap stocks that are going to create overvalue, undervalue, and it will be great value investor opportunity. The reason I think the industry is here to stay is you're getting a minimum, even as the market sold off, of $4 billion of issuance a month. So you're getting a $50 billion a year issuance or more. Wall Street makes money being investment bankers to SPACs. Sponsors make money because right? They put up risk capital and they get huge gearing or leverage on that, less so in the future. And there is a huge demand from the private equity shops and the venture capital shops of getting things public to raise more capital. Private equity wants to delever or they want to sell to somebody else and SPACs can use the deleveraging and venture capitals want to raise more money to grow. So there's a whole bunch of alignment and I actually think the SEC's crackdown on SPACs is going to enhance it to make it a more permanent asset class. So I think I answered that. Um, what is the rate of SPACs not reaching business? Okay, so one of the questions, there's a bunch of questions about SPACs failing. Like how many fail? What about the redemptions? You know, I'm gonna wrap it up with this and then I'm happy to set up calls, do another call for a group, answer emails. But if you invest in SPACs, as a fixed income security and you buy them at a discount, you don't actually care what the redemptions are, nor do you care if they liquidate, nor do you care if they merge and they're terrible companies or great companies. All you care about is I have a contractual right of a liquidation date where I'm gonna get par. I have the right to put it to the sponsors on a business combination and I've got an incentive to vote for the deal and redeem, right? When you, your redemption right is not tied to your vote. So you have incentive of, I'm gonna shorten my maturity by voting for you and I'm gonna redeem. The sponsors put in minimum cash amounts or the targets put them in to protect too much redemptions to allow them to keep looking or to make sure they have enough cash for the business plan going forward. Oftentimes it gets waived. Oftentimes they scurry around and cut special deals with us and others to try to make it um, go through anyway, where they call backstop arrangements that may or may not be good backstop arrangements. Um, you know, that's in the old days, the pipe was the solution to the redemption. So if every redeemed, the pipe solved it and anything that rolled over was better. By the way, the solution is just doing good deals, right? That's the solution. But as an investor as a fixed income like security, you don't really care. Those are all opportunities to do structuring, create deals, whatever. But as an individual investor, you don't care unless it destroys the industry, in which case it was a good time while you had it. Um, by the way, somebody's asking me about Pershing Square. Um, I'm happy to talk about it offline. Uh, just so you know, my ex-mentor is on the board of Pershing Square, which is Joe Steinberg. You know, happy to give you thoughts about what Bill has done with his, his SPAC that is different from other SPACs and various things like that. But it's not a conversation I can cover for this group quickly. Um, by the way, to show you how ridiculous the market got, back in October of last year, you could, some SPACs have options. You could sell put options, meaning the right for someone to put Pershing Square to you, struck at 20, which was their trust value, for $2, $1.75, $3, when it was trading above trust value at 22. And you could do it for, let's say, a, a three-month option, right? Expires in three months. And your risk was that Bill Ackman got a deal done and closed it in 90 days 
when he hadn't even announced the deal yet, which is practically impossible just based on all the stuff you have to go through and the size of his SPAC. And it was just mispriced. So there's a lot of mispricing going around. Um, somebody's asking me about con convexity. Uh, it's a convexity itself is a long conversation, but it, the common is the following. When you buy uh, the part that I think they want me to get to quickly. And again, I'm running out of time. We should have allocated more time. I literally have like 10 minutes, but if you buy SPACs at a discount to trust value and you value them on a yield to liquidation, and they announce the deal and close it sooner, you make more return, right? You get more positive convexity, but, or, or more positive outcome. Sorry, that's not a great way to look at it. But if they announce the deal and they don't close it, your duration or your maturity extends and your yield goes down. As far as convexity in relationship to interest rates, these are short-term securities. They're trading as a general group at a significant spread to their underlying choices. Remember, you're owning T-bills. So if you're buying something with a maturity of, let's say on average, one and a half years with 2% yield to liquidation, if interest rates go down, you might make money on spread, you might not. I mean, they are decaying pretty quickly. If interest rates go up, what tends to happen from both the high yield market and things that have wide spreads is initially just the spread compresses. Rates have to go up a lot for you to start having your spread widen out on you. Um, oh, I've been told I've got an extra five minutes. So we have 15 minutes. Okay, so, you know, um, I would say they're relatively interest insensitive at the moment based on where they're being priced. I think the bigger risk to SPACs on a mark to market basis, not ultimately return if you buy and hold them, but on a mark to market basis is who owns most of the SPACs out there? Well, they're hedge funds. Um, and there are merger art funds primarily. This is before they announce a deal. And hedge funds and merger art funds have historically been treating them as fixed income like securities with an out of the money equity call option if they announce a good deal. And these guys typically are not long term holders of the paper. And one of the reasons they like it so much right at the moment is they can borrow money. So they're leveraging the return. So firms like Millennium are probably getting eight times leverage on their SPAC book. Other firms are getting no name hedge funds are getting three times leverage. So the risk is that money flows out of the business, right? And they have to sell down their portfolio, blowing out the prices, which will create a great buying opportunity. So you have mark to market risk. And Peter Black wants to know if there's any risk at all. He just wants to know if there's zero risk. And the answer is, I would be ill-advised in a public forum, or for that matter, in any forum, as a financial advisor with the oversight of FINRA and the SEC and my compliance officer to say there's zero risk. And in fact, there's always risk. When you cross the street with a walk sign in a rural community, there's still the risk that somebody comes flying by and hits you and splats you like a bug. That being said, your risk is there are a couple risks, right? That people don't talk about. One, a company announces a deal and it gets approved and you forget or miss the redemption date. That's a problem because now you went from a fixed income investment to an equity investment, right? Or there is, unlike rules regarding shareholder um, proxy dates and voting dates that are governed by the SEC, the rules are broader for the redemption date to be set, right? They're not as um, structured. There is a risk that a company, I mean, there's likely to be at least one bad actor out there, plays around with the redemption dates in a way where, you know, you could get trapped because let's say you bought the stock after they announced the deal. And then they subsequently announce a redemption date that predates, you know, earlier than the shareholder date. And you get caught because your settlement date that you bought it, when you close it, 
is already after the redemption date. So that's a risk. So when you do merger arb, true merger arb, like announced deals, you have to be a little bit more focused on the redemption date. If you buy them, you know, early, way before there's an announced deal, you're going to be much safer there. The other thing is, look, if the U.S. government defaults, I know we're told the U.S. government security is a riskless asset. I personally think the mortgage on your home is your riskless asset. And that should be your, you know, either pay down your mortgage or invest because you, 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 you've guaranteed the mortgage and you've got to live somewhere. But if you, maybe because I spent too much time for Lucadia in places like Russia and Argentina, but if you believe that the government will default temporarily, what's likely to happen is T-bills are likely to go wider, right? And that's your collateral. And I doubt they're going to sell them at a loss and you can have it, but it could happen. Another risk is you buy it at collateral value, right? And you don't sell off the warrants and it goes to liquidation. And there are some expenses, albeit de minimis, that go against the trust. And instead of 10 bucks that you paid, you get $9.99. And we're not talking about you're going to get $9 or $9.80 or $9.90. I'm talking about a penny half a penny, quarter of a penny, but still, right? Or another risk, again, this is the one I quoted in the Wall Street Journal. I sounds a little um, salesy and, and sort of hawk like a P.T. Barnum kind of guy, but you know, no one has tested this because it's never come up nor needed to come up. But in theory, there's a very, very small, and well-written what can come out of the trust. And there are literally things like paying taxes, you know, as an example. <laughs> but let's say one of these lawyers is successful with some kind of shareholder lawsuit, which would make them completely unaligned and wouldn't make sense for them to put it in bankruptcy, but they get some kind of judgment. Or maybe some firm, typically SPAC sponsors are required when they use consultants and investment bankers to make it a non- that's based on success or based on the value of the sponsor capital, not the trust. But somehow somebody is a bad actor, doesn't get the paperwork signed, you know, and they don't have DNO insurance. I mean, they all have DNO insurance now. I mean, you wouldn't be able to go public if it didn't have DNO insurance, but whatever the reason, right? Um, and it files bankruptcy. You know, there'll be a question in the bankruptcy court. Is it a ring-fenced collateral just for the shareholders? Or do other general unsecured creditors take a piece? Even if that were to happen, it wouldn't be a huge number. And it wouldn't make sense because the lawyers would make more money. And then there's, of course, a concept in bankruptcy that says, if a company goes bankrupt and proceeds were paid to somebody 90 days before the bankruptcy, within that 90-day period, it's called a preference payment. In theory, they can unwind the whole thing and then they can force it. Again, it's like buying a bond that's a, a corporate bond where they raised all the money and they refinanced out their debt or a homeowner who got their mortgage refinanced and then they file bankruptcy and they try to claw it back. So there's always risk in things. I don't want to harbor on it, but there are risk things. Somebody said, how do you find companies to buy? I mean, there's the universe. You just do it. If you're asking the sponsors, believe me, nothing incentivizes a good investment banker like, hey, I've got a bunch of targets for you. Um, let me just look at some of the other questions real quickly. Uh, Grant, you ask a lot of questions that are great. I do think we should be careful uh, about answering some of them, like what the ETF is expected to return over the next 12 months. I think I've provided enough slides to give you an idea of what the market opportunity is. And I think we can talk more in detail to those that want to call us. Um, but I do think, quite frankly, uh, this is a question of will active management be better than you doing it yourself? You know, it depends who the active manager is, depends on what it is. It might just be random walk relative to the expenses of buying into a private fund or a public fund or a managed account or an ETF. Um, I'd like to think since we have a book in our current business today of four to 600 million of SPACs unlevered, and we participate in pipe shares in some of our funds, and in very, very rare cases, do we participate in sponsor shares? You know, I'd like to think we have a better inside uh, understanding of the industry. Um, the, the answer is, um, but, you know, I think you've got a sense of the market. Somebody asked, is the trust 
just restricted to government securities. So it's in the prospectus on specifically what they can buy. Most prospectuses are template, but there's all kinds of little nuances. So just like anything, you need to read the papers. You know, they, some prospectus is limited to cash and government securities. Some will include triple A or money market securities. So I think you have to read it very carefully, just like you should read what expenses can come out of the trust. Um, the other thing you have to read is what happens if, do they have the right to extend your liquidation date? So a company finds a deal, but their liquidation date approaches. So oftentimes SPACs will include language that says, we can pay you. 10 cents for a three month extension, or, and you don't have the right, so you get dragged along or tagged along. So that's an annualized 4%. Um, some allow you to decide if you want to redeem or extend. Some, there, I've seen SPACs to say, we have the right if we announce a deal to extend for six months to get prior to get approval. So now you bought it on yield to liquidation, not thinking that another six months could get tacked onto you. So, you know, I think reading the papers. Is important, but it's all public. It's all out there. A question we got to somebody is, how do I know what the value of the trust is on a regular basis? Um, the companies file public financials. They file 10Ks, they file 10Qs, they file 8Ks. In the 10Qs and 10Ks, they tell you the value of the collateral trust. So you don't know every day, but you certainly know every repeating period. Um, no, the collateral trust account is generally not particularly managed and it's usually sitting at a place like JP Morgan. Um, somebody asked, seems like a risk is that an investor misses the redemption date, correct? I'm just trying to go through all the questions. Uh, how many trustees are used in the space? Okay, I, I don't know the question of how many trustees are used in the space. Typically, a SPAC uses a trustee. Um, typically, they're high quality trustees. Um, they're, they're typically put in a trust account. So whenever you have a trust account, your counterparty really isn't the trust itself because it's segregated away. Your only risk would be the securities within that custodian account, right? Unlike a prime brokerage account or brokerage account where you're a general unsecured lender to that entity, in a, that's the point of a custodian account that you, you eliminate that counterparty risk. Uh, is there more risk to arbitrage of a SPAC yielding, say, 3 to 4% than 1 to 2%? So principal risk is all the same before they announce a deal. Before they announce a deal, your principal risk is all the same. Your return profile may differ, may differ greatly if a sponsor announces a great deal and it trades at $14 post-deal. That's really good versus 10. Or if they'll get a deal done quicker, right? Your return profile might change if they announce a deal, which has happened, and then they walk away and it gets pushed to liquidation, right? But don't forget, entry price makes a big difference. Um, the, um, let's see, uh, seems like uh, a risk that investor missed the redemption vote. I said, yes. Um, could you address the trend you're seeing today Warrants. Okay, so this is a question. Today, real quickly, somebody said, can you talk about what's out there today in the IPO world? So today, let's assume it's a not a bad or first-time sponsor, and it's not a great sponsor. Market today for sort of a, a reasonable sponsor today is usually some over-collateralization. They were giving away franchise. Oh, wait, let me start over. All of three weeks ago, Sponsors were giving away founder shares to IPO anchors, right, as an incentive to anchor the deal. So what I mean by that, you're doing a $200 million SPAC, you write a check for $20 million, you get what everybody else gets, but we'll throw in some founder shares for free. In fact, across the board, our firm owns founder shares we got for free. You might notice them in the Crossing Bridge pre-merger SPAC ETF as an example for people to understand what a founder share is. We currently have them priced at zero, by the way. Um, that will change as the unit split and as they announce deals. Um, but the current market today, more or less, because I just did one literally today, was it was 1020 in trust. So that's 2%. It was half a warrant. Half a warrant is worth using 28 cents sort of unit contribution, whether it's half or one, is another 2.8%, but you're not going to get it until the back end. So it's assuming you sell the warrant at 28 cents. 
right, to reduce your basis. And then you pick up the $10 at the end of the deal, right? And it's over collateralized by 2% or 20 cents. So the estimated gross yield, let's say is 4.8%. And it's a, this happened to be a 15 month deal with no extension, right? So you could say, I'm gonna earn 4.8% simple, right? I'm gonna sell the warrant. I'm gonna get it back later. I got 20 cents over collateralization over 15 months. That's a pretty standard deal. There was another deal I saw got priced today with no over collateralization, a third of a warrant from a spa sponsor who's on their second SPAC and they're not gonna get it done there unless they have friends and family. So you can more, more than happy to call us or email us because I'm being, the hook is coming out like the, you know, the Oscars. Um, you can email me. This is my email, david at kohanzik.com. You can also email me at dsherman at crossing. Actually, you can email me at david at crossingbridge.com. You can email John Connor uh, at crossingbridge.com. Some people have left their emails in public forum here, which I probably wouldn't have done, um, but that's okay. Um, but you, I, I don't know if we're gonna be able to download these messages, so you should just email us. Um, so you can, our, our main number, if you want to call us, it's here, 914-749-9600. It's up on the screen. You want to copy the presentation, you can go to the website and download it at crossingbridgefunds.com. And as David's doing that, we want to say thank you again to Flya for hosting us today on the webinar. Big thank you to David. A lot of the comments that this is very informative for people. So um, David, thank you again. And as David mentioned, if there are any questions or any follow-up, please don't hesitate in reaching out. And um, you know, hopefully we can do this again soon. And real quickly, and we're out of time, uh, the Flya folks, are, I believe, are going to be having an ETF conference sometime in November. I think November fourth, but I'm not 100 sure. Um, because, and uh, they've asked us if we could talk in general about SPACs in more detail than we did here. So more for you're already sort of educated. We're going to assume you're somewhat educated. We're going to talk more about the SPAC current market, both what's going on pipes redemptions, you know, pricing, all some of those questions that are coming in now. Um, we're also going to talk in fairness about your SPAC options and different ways, whether you want to be a warrant buyer and what the advantages are or fixed income. And also there's a bunch of other SPAC ETFs. They're all very different. The SPAC ETF, Crossing Bridge Pre-Merger SPAC ETF, SPC, is, is probably the, the one that has the tightest language requiring us to buy SPACs at below uh, trust value and requiring us to dispose of the shares. There are others that do something similar. Their language is broader, but they may actually execute exactly the same way. So, and they may do a better job than us. Maybe they do a worse job. I don't know. I mean, or they're complementary. You own a little bit of both. I mean, I'm not here on a competitive basis. Um, there's SPACs that do post-merger deals. So we'll talk about the different SPACs that I'm aware of in the ETF market and where they're similar and different as well to try to give you a broader education. So that's all I've got time for. Um, I'm being pulled out with a hook. Thank you for your time. David, thank you. John, thank you very much. Um, thank you to, to Crossing Bridge Advisors. Very interesting uh, presentation today.